We praise God for giving us this privilege. I was moved and impressed to share that which I will share with you this blessed Sabbath morning. It is a serious discussion and I believe as young leaders in these last days, days that are corrupt and distressed by sin, I pray that we may find hope, lessons and admonition from our Father as we worship Him. Let us pray and plead for God to guide us in our study this Sabbath morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise You. Oh, we praise You, dear Father, for this is a beautiful place. You have gathered Your beautiful people and You have given us a beautiful word. We praise You, O God, for You are the God of true beauty. We can never understand what beauty is unless we gaze into the pages of the scriptures. We praise you then that as your people, as your young men and women, you have gathered us to understand the true purpose of our existence. Thank you for the journey we began last night and you spoke to us, Lord. Commitments were made in your presence. Hearts were sealed and submitted to you last night. We plead that there may be nothing keeping us from our march to understand and appreciate you more. Help us then this Sabbath morning as we worship you on this mountain top. It was your practice as you would move away into the quiet of the mountains and then reflect on the goodness of your Father. We also, O oh Lord, would like to do what Jesus did. We also would like to take this time and I pray that this time away from, from the sin that's found in the city, we have moved away on this mountain top to experience our nearness to our Savior. Speak to us then, O God, do away sin from this camp of your spiritual Israel and prepare us, prepare us for heaven is our prayer we do plead. O Holy Spirit, we cry out to you to come and possess us. We plead with you to be our faithful guide as you are promised in the Bible and teach us that which you have prepared for us is our humble prayer. We pray, adore and praise you for answering it for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, I was, I was telling my friends, I wish I had this view and you had this view because this is a beautiful view uh, behind us. Exodus chapter 2, are you there? Yes, some of you are there. Exodus chapter 2, let's go to verse 1. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. Is everyone there? Okay, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife to a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch, put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. Who are we talking about? Moses. The commandment is given by Pharaoh to, to kill all the children, to keep them from increasing. The command goes out and then the children and this persecution and this killing begins to happen. Moses' mother tries to hide away Moses in an ark and then she covers it with slime and prepares it and, and makes it waterproof. Puts the baby Moses in this basket and, and puts it at the brink of the river. Who watches over this basket? Moses' own sister. What's her name? Miriam. Miriam, she stood afar off. And verse 4 tells me that she stood afar off to wit what would happen to him. She stood afar off to, 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 to make sure that her baby brother is safe. You know, it was not an easy task. Miriam herself was young. 
and she had to, to, to traverse through the treacherous waters of the river, the ups and downs and the rapids and the stones. She had to make sure that my baby brother does not get hurt. It was a difficult task. She could have gotten hungry. There could have been dangerous creatures lurking around to capture her and destroy her. And, and she wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid. Young as she was, she wasn't afraid because her eyes were fixed on baby Moses. Could not take her eyes off. Gazing into her because she wanted her brother to be safe and sound. Interesting story, interesting characters. In Exodus 14, you know, many ages, many years pass on. In Exodus 14, God has delivered His children out of the hand of the Egyptian command. He has delivered His children and they, they go and begin their journey. In Exodus 12, they are, are, are asked to take the lamb and, and they're asked to kill the lamb and blood on the doorpost. You all know the story. The story is found in Exodus 12. In Exodus 14, they're still traversing their way and they come to the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. Amazing miracle. I wish you guys were there. An amazing miracle. He parts the Red Sea and the Bible tells me they walked on dry ground. You know, when we came here this morning, this was wet. They had to sweep it off and, and they had to mop it off. But they walked on dry ground. Understand, understand. It was the, it was the, it was the sea bed. It was the river bed. And the seabed was soaked by ages of water in it. And when God stepped in, He soaked up the waters even from the seabed. They walked on dry ground and onto the other side, the waters rush back in. And the Egyptian army is destroyed by the rushing waters. Go with me to Exodus 15. This is the experience right after they come out of the Red Sea. Exodus 15 and verse 21. It's an amazing story. Exodus 15 and verse 21. And Miriam answered them. You still know, still remember Miriam? The same little girl. Same little girl with her eyes on baby Moses. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And Miriam led the nation of Israel in singspiration. She gathered them together. She says, let's sing a song unto the Lord. I can see her standing up on a high pedestal, asking the nation of Israel, let's come together and worship the Lord for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider that were chasing us, He has thrown them into the sea. Miriam, having gathered the ladies, having gathered the men, when you read verse 20, Exodus 15 and verse 20, and all the women went out after her with timbrel and with dances. And you'll hear people say, you know, oh, see, people danced in the Bible. So it's good for Adventists to dance today. See, this dance is very different from the dance you see in the club these days. Have you ever received an A in your class? Let me see your hands. A grade A in your class. A final grade A in any of your classes. One person. Oh boy. Only one person has ever received a perfect score. None of you ever received a perfect score. Are you serious? No, you're not. Are you joking? None of you, in all your life, you've never received a perfect score? My friend, I feel very sorry for you. We'll talk later, we'll talk later. How do you feel when you get that, that grade of A, you get a perfect score? I don't know about you, see, when I, when I was very young, when I was very young, I remember that when I, when I got my final grade for all my, my whole class, and I was told that I will be graduated to the next class, I had a ritual that I used to practice. I would come home and I would jump on my bed as much as I could. That was my every year ritual. Every time I was told, you know, you've passed all your things, you will be promoted to the next class. I would come and jump and jump and jump on my bed. It's called a dance. It's called a victory dance. 
You're not dancing to music. You can't stop leaping and rejoicing and shouting because you have been saved. This was not a dance that you find in the club. This was a dance of victory, a dance of joy. They were together. Now understand, Exodus 15, 20 tells us that Miriam went forth forward. She began to lead this inspiration and all the women followed her with timbrels and with dances of joy. They were giving glory to God. They have a term. They have an office for a woman like Miriam in today's terms. They call them women's ministries director. She went out forward and all the ladies followed her. She was a great example for the ladies to follow. We're looking at a leader. Are we together? We're looking at a leader. A leader that from a young age gazed into baby Moses. The same leader leading all the nations, especially the ladies, and, and coming together and singing praises to God for he had given them victory. We're enjoying, we're enjoying this leader by the name Miriam. Come with me now, years later, to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Is everyone there? Okay, verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron. Who is Aaron, by the way? Brother of who? Moses. Not of Miriam? Miriam also. Are you sure? Just checking. Just checking. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, siblings. Moses is the one who leads the Israelites out of the Egyptian bondage. You have Miriam, the women's ministry director. You have Aaron. Who was Aaron? What was his office? Just a priest? He was a high priest. He was not an ordinary priest. He was the high priest of the nation of Israel. Moses, leader of the nation. Miriam, women's ministry director. Aaron, the high priest of the nation. You're looking at three leaders. You're looking at three leaders in the same family. Three leaders. Three leaders. And now observe what happens in verse 1. Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. Don't forget, they're siblings. And the brother and sister team up and they speak against Moses. Because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Miriam and Aaron, one is a high priest, other is a women's ministry director. They come together and speak against the leader of the nation. They say, we're unhappy with you. Why? Because you have married an Ethiopian woman. Somebody tell me why this is so bad. Why are they complaining so, so adamantly regarding this? Is Ethiopia a bad place? Who said yes? I have friends from Ethiopia. Don't say that. Why were they so upset? You married an Ethiopian woman. See, I, I, I can see a glimpse and I can see a reflection of a personal problem that Miriam is facing. See, all this while, all this while, Moses the leader, Aaron the high priest, there's no other female figure. And Miriam was the only one and being a part of the family, being the leader of the women, all focus was always given unto her and all of a sudden now Moses has a wife. And the attention will all go now to the, not to the sister. There's more to it because, because Israel was a chosen nation. Israel was a chosen nation and, and, and the commands were given that you know marriages have to happen within the nation of Israel. And here was Moses who left his nation, went out and married an Ethiopian woman. You will be amazed to know that this is the gospel message in summary. That's strange. Moses marrying an Ethiopian, this is the gospel message in summary. What does that mean? 
See, all through the ages down, since the, the choosing of the nation of Israel in Exodus 19, by the way, when God seals a covenant with them, gives them the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, God had chosen them. In Exodus 19, when you go home and, and when you have the break time, go through Exodus 19, God tells them, if you obey my commands, you'll be a peculiar people, a, a nation of priests, and I will use you and glorify you and, and empower you for my service. They were the chosen generation, the Jewish race, people of Israel, people of Jerusalem. These were God's chosen people. And God was preaching the gospel of salvation as early as Numbers chapter 12. What do I mean? See, when Christ came to this earth, the Jews were completely separated from the Gentiles. Anybody who's not a Jew has nothing to do with salvation. Get out. They looked down upon Gentiles and, and everyone was cast down and looked down upon. In a world so distraught and so broken, Christ came to teach. And, and when you begin to notice, there are many miracles that he did upon Gentile people. See, Jesus was preaching the message in the New Testament that salvation is for all. Jesus was preaching in the New Testament in John 3.16 that for God so loved who? The world, not Seventh-day Adventists alone. He loved the world, which is why He gave His only begotten Son. And, and you might think this is a new verse. But God was preaching the same message as early as Numbers 12, when Moses was sent out by God to go and marry an Ethiopian woman, a Gentile woman, to tell the nation of Israel that salvation is for everybody, not just for Israel. We have the truthfulness of the gospel message in Numbers chapter 12. So they're speaking against him. See, you'll understand. We're going to look at a few verses, but you'll understand how, how deep and serious these verses are. Verse 2. They said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? They're, they're, they're accusing Moses and they're telling the nation, wait a second. Has God only spoken to Moses? Has he not spoken to us? I mean, God speaks to us also. Why is Moses always given the preference? Why is he the one always at the top? We can do all things also. We can lead inspiration. We can do voting and we can hold on a general meeting. Why is Moses always at the top? This is, this is not right. God has spoken to us as well. God has not only spoken to Moses. Verse 3. Uh, verse 2 rather ends by saying, And the Lord heard it. Verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was the humblest man that walked the face of the earth. Verse 4, And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out you three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. Out of the whole congregation, God said, Moses, Miriam, Aaron, get out and come to the tabernacle. You remember the, the sanctuary tabernacle? Yes, I hope so. The sanctuary is a very powerful message for our church. So they're asked, three of them, come out, meet me at the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out in verse 4, verse 5. The Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle. The Lord Himself comes down. He hears what Miriam and Aaron are talking about. The Lord Himself comes down in the form of a cloud. He stands in the door of the tabern tabernacle. This is significant because judgments happened at the door of the tabernacle. This is where judgments were pronounced. So God Himself now comes down in the form of a cloud and these three know what's coming next. This is an intense scene. I don't know about you. I get scared every time I read this passage. And called, when they come and stood in the door of the tabernacle in verse 5, and he called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. God came in the form of a cloud. He looked at Aaron and Miriam. He said, Aaron, Miriam, come forward. And Aaron and Miriam stepped forward. It must have been a scary incident. 
God speaking from the cloud and his mighty voice. And both of them had to step forward, verse 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. God is saying, you know, prophets, I reveal myself to the prophets by giving them visions and dreams. This is how I reveal myself to the prophets. Verse 7, my servant Moses is not so. In other words, Moses is not a prophet who is faithful in all my house. What is God trying to say? Verse 8, with him will I speak mouth to mouth. In other words, with him I will speak face to face, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude or the image of the Lord shall he behold. So him, I don't come to him in visions and dreams. I speak to him directly. He sees and beholds my image. Then he continues and says, Wherefore then, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Knowing the kind of man Moses is, were you not afraid to point a finger at my faithful servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Let's review. Miriam, the young girl with her eyes on the basket, making sure baby Moses is not lost or destroyed by the rapids. The same lady Miriam, who went out and led the Israelites in singing and praises to the master because he had given them victory. And then one day, then one day, Miriam stood up and spoke against the very brother she had fixed her eyes upon at one point of time. Moses, Moses was the deliverer of the Egyptian race. You all know that, yes? Moses was the deliverer. He's the one who delivered them from the hand of bondage and took them out to be followed by God. The same Moses who was the deliverer was now a grown up man and Miriam who at one point had fixed her eyes on this deliverer, had fixed her eyes on this baby Moses was now speaking against this deliverer. My friends, I need us to glean and understand something that this leader is doing wrong. She had fixed her eyes on this deliverer Moses and then one day she took them eyes off and she was speaking against, working against this deliverer called Moses. I know of a much greater deliverer by the name Jesus Christ. And I know leaders who have walked with Jesus and Jesus was a deliverer who delivered us not just from a nation, not just from any bondage, but he delivered us from the nation of sin and from the bondage of evil. Are there leaders here then who at one point had fixed their eyes on their deliverer, but today their eyes are away from Jesus? Are there leaders then who at one point had had their gaze fixed, they could not take their eyes off of Jesus. They were following him, following his commands, following his footsteps. And then one day they take their eyes off of their deliverer and begin to work against their deliverer. Miriam and Aaron begin to speak against Moses, their own brother. And they're jealous. Jealous, understand this is a leader. Both of them are leaders. One is a pastor. And both of them are jealous because a guy who's not a pastor is given a higher authority than a pastor and a women's ministry director. Are you listening? Two leaders got jealous of another leader and I pray that that never happens in this group. Two leaders got jealous and began to speak against the one called by God. And notice, notice, notice the claims they made are very similar claims that I hear today in the church. Oh really, he can only preach? We cannot preach? We can also preach. Oh, she's the only one who can sing? No, I can sing better. 
Oh, he's the only one who can be president? I've been presidents for many other associations. Leaders. Leaders. Fighting. See, 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 leave alone the fact that they're leaders. Look at the fact that they're actually brothers and sister. So leave alone the leadership aspect of it and getting jealous. They're jealous of their own brother and sister. Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses. The Lord himself comes down and he tells Miriam and Aaron step forward. How dare you speak to my son like this? Who gave you the right to speak in such tone and speak against him? Who told you that it was okay for you to talk like this about him? Don't you know I speak to him face to face? How dare then you raise a finger at my chosen servant? My friends, be very careful. Be very careful as a leader when you point a finger at another leader. Be very careful before you start talking about each other anyhow you feel like. You'll understand how serious that is. Let's continue our story. Verse 9 tells us that the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. Kindled against them. I can, I can see why. I can see why. They erred. They went away because their eyes were away from the deliverer. My friends, as a leader, I need you to understand very distinctly and very clearly while you will be doing great things for the ministry, doing great things and bringing many people into the fold, never end up in a state and a pedestal where you begin to think that you belong here, that you belong at the top and you deserve to be at the top. Don't ever let that thought enter your heads. It's going to lead you toward, to your ruin like you've never seen before. Pride had entered their hearts. And if I've seen leaderships fall, it's for this prime purpose, which is pride. And we emphasized last night, and I will emphasize this over and over again till tomorrow when I speak the last message. Humility is key to leadership. Is key to leadership. If you cannot be humble, you can forget about being leaders. If we have time later in the day, I will share a passage with you. Just one verse and speak about how powerful humility is. <laughs> verse 10, verse 10. And the cloud departed. Who was in the cloud? God. God came in the form of a cloud. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. Have you ever seen a person who has leprosy? Yes, who's seen? Let me see your hand. Who's seen a leprous patient? Anyone else? You've seen a leprous patient? Those of you who have not seen a leprous patient, have you studied about leprosy? Yes? Someone tell me what happens when you get leprosy. Cannot, cannot feel. You're, you're moving way into afterwards. What's the first sign when you get leprosy? What begins to happen? Hands what? Okay, they club. Okay, you have white spots. You have you have sort of like boils all over the body. You have you have white spots. See, see, that's why that's why she was white as snow. How many of you have tried whitening creams, whitening lotions? How many of you have tried them? Maybe I should rephrase. How many of you have not tried them? Because in this country, in this country, whitening is a serious issue. <laughs> whitening is a serious issue. You don't like the color you were given, so you want to change that color. You want to look whiter. Try leprosy next time. <laughs> she, was, she was white as snow. She was struck with leprosy. Read the text very carefully. You're going to see something profound. Verse 10. The cloud departed, and behold, Miriam became leprous. Did you hear a voice from the cloud saying, Miriam, you will get leprosy for what you have done? 
Is that what God said? God, what did God do? He just, and when God just departed, what happened to Miriam? She became leprous. I need you to understand. You need to understand. This was not a curse that God gave her. Miriam, you will become leprous. No. God's presence only departed. She had pushed God so far out of her life that the disease that was in her heart is the disease that was now on her skin. You know, my friends, leprosy is a very dangerous disease. It begins as these boils. It takes away, it brings you to numbness. It takes away sensation. You can't feel anything. And peace after peace, your body begins to fall. One finger after another, one limb after another, your nose falls off, your ears fall off. Leprosy eats you up, but it eats you up slowly. And I introduce to you this Sabbath morning, the leprosy of sin. Sin is extremely leprous. It comes to you in subtle ways, but peace after peace, sin will eat you away. I tell you that right now. They lead peace after peace. It'll eat a peace, and you won't like eating eating you know, the Bible word anymore. It will eat away a piece of you and you won't want to pray anymore. It will eat away a piece of you and you don't want to go to church. It will eat away a piece and you will never feel like sharing the word of God. Sin is leprous. And her heart was diseased with leprosy. Sin was in her heart. It was corrupting her. It was eating her away. So when God departed, this was not a curse God pronounced. This is what happens when we push God out of our lives. Leaders, I need you to understand something very distinctly and something very carefully. There is a sacred responsibility that rests on every shoulder seated here this morning. Be very careful how you treat this sacred responsibility. Being a leader is no joke. Being a leader is not about fashion and accolades and your name on some placard. Being a leader is about being on the ground. It's about sleeping in the dust. It's about wiping someone else's shoes. It's about a base material. It's not how high you can get and how air conditioned you can get. It's about how low you're willing to go to help another out. Her leadership was a very bad example. See, 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 we have not hit that yet, but pause with me and think. The sanctuary tabernacle in the wilderness was in the middle and everybody camped around the tabernacle. Three leaders are in the camp. Two of them have spoken against Moses. The nation is listening. And two of them now stand in front and they see God pronouncing a judgment upon these two. And one of them becomes leprous. Tell me what example did they set for the nation? See, don't take this calling lightly. You see, I began softly last night. There's no more time to be soft now with you. This is serious. See, I want us to understand while serving God is powerful and joyful and exciting. It's not, it's not your everyday work. It's not your everyday job. It's a sacred responsibility. And you better respect it. Here were two leaders who were an extremely baleful example. A pathetic example now to the whole nation. They were speaking against their brother and people must be thinking, really as a leader this is how they behave? Is this how leaders behave? Leaders are jealous? Leaders are proud? And then they see Miriam get leprosy. Oh no. I thought she was having a great walk with God. I thought she was our leader. Ladies were, um, were shocked. They were like, what? We were looking up to her and now she is leprous? Be very careful what example you're setting for people around you. See, this, this didn't happen overnight. This hatred in her heart and Aaron's heart, this didn't come overnight. It took time, one instance after another, one age after another, one incidence and one event after another. And people began to notice, whether you know it or not, people are watching, I told you last night. They're beholding you and they're looking at Miriam and Aaron and they're thinking, oh, so 
is it possible then for me to be proud and still be a women's ministry director? Oh, I think it's okay for me to be very proud and very boastful and still be a high priest, still be a pastor. That's the example they were setting for the nation. And God could not tolerate that. Could not tolerate that. Then there was another leader. Moses. Moses. Did Moses complain when Miriam and Aaron spoke against him? He didn't complain. Not at all. Who complained? God. God complained. Leaders, here is a lesson for you. When people point fingers at you, they make fun of you, they mock you. Vengeance is not yours. Stay quiet. Shut up those lips for a while. Don't retaliate right away. You might stay quiet, but I tell you this morning, there is a God who is at work. Nobody, nobody will attack a child of God and stay in peace. Nobody will do that. So know for a fact that if God has called you, God is using you, there's nobody who can point a finger at you and live in peace for the rest of his life. God watches and he is serious about the people he has called and he watches over them with power and strength and might and deliverance. You're looking at three leaders. They push God's presence out. Miriam becomes leprous. Are you sleepy? Wow. You're so sleepy you couldn't even respond. Are you sleepy? No, even if you are, I will still go on. Miriam was leprous, her face was white, her skin was white, she had, she had spots all over her body, she was extremely leprous. And I know ladies, tell me if I'm lying, they're extremely conscious about how their face looks. Raise your hand if I'm lying. Do you all agree? Ladies are extremely, oh boy, the lengths they go to to make sure that the face looks right. The lengths, oh, I tell you, the lengths they go to to make sure that the face looks good. Understand then that Miriam is also a lady. Now her face was plagued with leprosy. Do you think she was walking around just like that and she was happy about it? How do you see her? There's no cosmetic surgery and what not in those days. How do you see Miriam then? What was she doing? Hiding. But she has to go about everyday work. So what would she be doing? Cover. Oh, interesting. Cover. Cover her face. Have you seen? You're, you're staying. Are you staying in the Philippines? How many of you have been to Mindanao? How many of you are from Mindanao? Let me see that. Let me see that. Wow. Okay. Have you seen Muslim ladies? Yes. Have you seen how they dress? Yes. Covered. Not because they have leprosy. But they're covered. And that's what the religion teaches them. Herein is Miriam, not because she's practicing any religion, but she's plagued with leprosy, but she has to go about everyday business. But in the camp, I see Miriam now covering her face. Covering her face because she does not have conscious as she is as a woman does not want anyone to look at what sin has done to her face. So she puts a veil over her face and she's hiding the shame of sin. You know, there was, there was another face in the camp that day. Another face in the camp that day. We find that face in Exodus 34. <laughs> Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34 verse 30. Is everyone there? Yeah. Exodus 34 and verse 30. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. Moses had gone up the mountain after 40 days and 40 nights of communion with his master. He had beheld the glory of God and now his face was glowing with the brightness of God. And they could not look at him. 
could not look at him. They were afraid to even come near him because he was shining with God's glory. Go to verse 35. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put a veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Moses had to cover his face with a veil because he was shining with God's glory. That day in the camp, there were two leaders with two faces. One leader, a face of shame and sin. A face plagued with the leprosy of sin. And there was another face that was shining with the brightness of the glory of God. My question is, what face are you? As a leader, what face are you? What are you hiding under that face? What is that man and woman that you're hiding today? Have you spent time with God? Have you spent your 40 days and 40 nights of communion with God? Have you beheld His glory and are shining forth the glory of God? Or is there a leader in our midst who is plagued with the leprosy of sin? You know, it amazes me. It amazes me. She spoke against a human being and she got leprous. She spoke against a being. She sinned against a man and this is what happened to her. Here's my question. What makes us think? What makes us think then that if I sin against God, there's no problem at all? She sinned against a man and she was plagued. Are you sure you can sin against God and go free? We better deal seriously with sin, my friends. It will plague your ministry. It will destroy your ministry from reaching out to anyone. Don't play with sin. Don't play with sin. My next question. Miriam and Aaron both were speaking against Moses, yes? Why did Miriam get leprosy and Aaron did not? Someone. Both were speaking against, yes? Why did one get leprosy, other did not? Anyone? Some are looking down, so I don't even look at them and ask them something. Why did one get leprosy and the other did not? Did both of them commit the same sin? Yes. Why is one getting leprosy, others not? Here's the love of God. God will every single time differentiate. God will always differentiate between the one who is misleading and the one who is misled. Are you thinking? God will always create a difference between the one misleading and the one misled. Aaron is the high priest. His name should have been the top label when the story mentioned them. But when you read, when you read Numbers 12 and verse 1, whose name was given first? Miriam and Aaron. Miriam and Aaron spoke against. We now understand also because of the woman context that there's another woman in the picture. So we also see that that thing coming from Miriam, it would not have come from Aaron. Because he has nothing to do with another lady coming. No attention is going to be taken away from him. So here a woman is speaking and she's presented first. So the Bible is helping us understand there is a difference between the one misleading and the one misled. There are leaders who are misleading people and there are leaders who are misled by other leaders. Understand that both are leading. See, all of you are leaders. Yes? You're still doubtful. All of you are leaders, yes? yes? But here's the difference. One of you is leading people to death and one of you is leading people to life. My question is, which one are you? Two leaders, two leaders, extremely well versed. But there's a leader who was misleading and there was a leader who was misled. And God, I tell you, will always differentiate between one who misleads and the one who is misled. 
the one who was misleading, got a heavier punishment. But here's my question, did Aaron get a punishment as well? Was Aaron punished? Was Aaron punished? Yes, no? No. Are you sure? Yes. Yes and no. Or. Yes and no. Was Aaron punished, yes or no? I think your answer should be, we don't know. <laughs> yes, that should be. Is that what you're trying to say? We don't know, when you say no. Okay, I, I catch you, I catch you. Let me tell you something. Aaron's punishment was much worse than Miriam's. You don't read, it's not written there, but, but read between the lines. Aaron's punishment was much worse than Miriam. In the Hebrew setting, in the wilderness, in the camps, even in Jesus' time, when you got sick, there were no establishments. There were no people like Jackson and others studying medicine. When you got sick, you got leprosy, where did you have to go to get checked? To the high priest. You had to go to the priest and the priest would have to declare whether you're leprous or not. Now in case of leprosy, when you went to the priest, the priest had to tell the nation, Behold, this person is unclean. And when they walked around, they had to shout, Unclean, 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 and everybody had to move out of the way. Who is Aaron? Miriam's own brother. And now the own brother who is a high priest has to stand in the front of the whole congregation and tell them, behold, behold, this woman has leprosy. She is unclean. Wait a second. Aaron sinned as well, yes? Aaron was supposed to get leprosy as well, yes? But he didn't. And I want you to know that his promise and his, his not his promise, his punishment was much worse than Miriam's. See, when he looked at Miriam that day and he pointed his hand out and said, she is leprous. I can hear him twitching and trembling while he said that. I can see him. I see him trembling and, and twitching because he is thinking and he's saying, you know, that should actually be me. I should be leprous as well. I committed, I spoke against my brother. I did this thing and I know I should have gotten leprosy as well. So as he's saying she's leprous, he is trembling and twitching within because he knows that that white skin should be on him as well. His limbs also should be falling. His ears should be falling as well because of leprosy. And he knows that. And he trembles. And he trembles. And he trembles. My friends, many, many years ago, there was a story told in the land called Jerusalem. There a man had come a man had done great things and the word got around. This man is amazing. He heals. He provides. He rescues. He's risen people from the dead. Great things were being talked about this man called Christ Jesus. The time was Passover. And where is my brother Junre? Where is he? Oh boy, one leader is missing. What's happening? <laughs> Misled. Wow. 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 Some of, some of you are very courageous. Eh? I'll tell him when he comes. Okay. <laughs> but the Junre sang a song last night talking about the incidents when Christ was being crucified. And he sang in his song, it was the time of the Passover and everybody had gathered. See, at Passover, which is a Jewish feast, we don't have the time to go there. It was a Jewish feast. Every Jew in the whole world had to come to Jerusalem to participate in the Passover festival. So people had come and, and a man had come from a far place. He came into Jerusalem and, and, and he came and he heard the great news about this great man called Christ Jesus. He went around and heard this news and that news. And then he hears, you know what, they're going to kill him. And he's thinking to himself, why are they going to kill him? I thought he was a great man healing, feeding, resurrecting. Why are they killing him? And he can't understand. Before he comes to his senses, he sees a large crowd marching. 
in the crowd he sees. He, he tries to push his way through. He wants to see what's happening. And as he beholds, he sees um, three men, three men carrying the cross on their back. They point to him and they help him see that this one is Jesus. He's the man we were talking about. And this man takes a gaze at this Jesus who was flogged and whipped. See, flogging, the whipping process was extremely painful and extremely dreadful. See, at the end of the whip were nails and pieces of bone that would shred flesh out. You know, there were flogging procedures where when they were flogged, the intestines had fallen out because there was no flesh to support it. It was a painful extremely derogatory method of persecuting criminals and so he's wondering why is such a good man treated this way and he sees after the blood is all over the place it's dripping it's all over him and he sees him carrying this heavy cross before this man realizes he feels heavy hands upon his back and they take him and they say come here you're going to carry his cross they take the cross off the shoulders of Jesus and put it onto the cr shoulders of this man. Who is this man? Jo oh boy. You disappoint me. Who is the man carrying the cross? Simon. Where is he from? Arimathea. Simon is from Cyrene, not from Arimathea. You're talking about Joseph of Arimathea, the tomb in which Jesus was laid. But this is Simon from Cyrene. And Simon from Cyrene has come and, and they take the cross off of the back of Jesus and put it on the back of Simon. And now Simon has to carry the cross. Work with me, we're going somewhere. Simon carries the cross and in himself he's telling himself, you know what? The people who carry the cross are criminals. And the ones who carry get nailed to the cross. So he's beginning to think, what have I done that this cross is on my back? What have I done that they put this? Are they going to nail me to the cross also? Because only criminals get nailed. But now I'm the one carrying the cross. So am I a criminal? And am I getting nailed? He was dreading in his heart. But he carries the cross and he carries the cross and he carries the cross. And he's in pain and he doesn't know. He walks down Via Dolorosa and up the hill called Calvary. And when they get there, to the amazement of Simon, they take the cross again off of his back and onto the back of Jesus. And Jesus gets nailed to the cross. My friends, the Bible tells me, the Bible tells me, you all have to carry your cross, but you don't have to die on the cross. The Bible tells me that you carry your cross, but Jesus gets nailed to it. You commit the sin, but he pays the penalty. You fall, but he lifts you up. That day, I know what Simon felt. I know what Simon felt that day. As Jesus was put on the cross and the first nail went through the hand of Jesus, I see Simon's hand trembling because he's telling himself, you know what? That should have been my hands. Because I was the one carrying and I'm the criminal and I know that I was supposed to be there and he's, and he's trembling and he's thinking, you know, that actually should have been me. When, when they nail his feet, Simon is looking and he's like, oh no, that actually should have been me. And his feet are trembling. When they pierce his side, I can see Simon reach out for his side. And he holds his side thinking that, you know, that actually should have been my side, my friends. That should be the example and the experience of every leader today. You ought to look at the cross of Christ Jesus and tremble with fear, knowing that that should have been you. Knowing that you committed the sin and Romans 6.23 said that the wage of sin is and all of you and including me should die. But Jesus says you commit the sin but I pay the wage through my death. Each time you and I look at the sacrifice of Jesus we ought to tremble because that should have been us. That was the experience of Aaron. Aaron trembled because here was a reminder of sin, Miriam. And he knew that that should have been me. And Jesus took the sins of the whole world and died on the cross. My friends, we ought to tremble. For it is because of him that we have life and not outside of him. Trembling when looking at the sacrifice on the cross. Aaron's punishment 
was worse because he had to live with this now for the rest of his life. He had to live in that tremble knowing that I committed a sin and I actually deserved to get leprous as well. Let's draw this down. Go back to Numbers 12. We're still in our story. We're not done there yet. Numbers 12 and verse 13. Moses cried unto the Lord saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Are you there? Numbers 12, 13. Moses is praying to the Lord and he cries out in plea. He says, Lord, heal her now, I beseech thee. I beg you, God, please heal my sister. This is the same lady who has spoken against Moses. And now Moses is the one praying for the one who spoke against him. My friends, here is a leader who when he is mocked and made fun of, he does not retaliate. He goes down on his knees and says, Lord, forgive them for what they have said. Forgive them of their sin. Heal them of this leprosy of sin. My friends, we need Moses's today. We need Moses today who will set an example. See, understand now the example that was being set for the whole nation. They were beholding two who were complaining against Moses and they were receiving their punishment. And then the whole nation was also looking at Moses and they saw Moses praying for the people who wronged him. When was the last time you prayed for those who wronged you? Think about it. When someone retaliates, says a bad word about you, do you go down on your knees and pray for that person? And say, Lord, please forgive them. Because that's what a leader ordained by God does. A leader ordained by God does not retaliate with hard, harsh words and hateful language. He goes down on his knees and pleads for the forgiveness of the other. Verse 15. Verse 15, as we draw this to a close, and Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. Verse 15 continues, and the people journeyed not. And the people journeyed not. Miriam was thrown out of the camp because, my friends, God does not tolerate sin within the camp. He took sin and sin. That was a reminder uh, on upon Miriam. She had to be thrown outside the camp. And the camp did not move. They did not journey for how many days? Tell me, where were they going? They were going to the promised land called Canaan. They were marching to their promised land and because of one sin, the Bible tells me they could not journey for seven days. Their march to their promised land was delayed by seven days. Sin retarded their growth towards the promised land. Sin took them back by schedule. Seven days and they were seven days short of experiencing the bounties of the promised land. My friends, all of us, all of us are marching to our promised land called heaven. And I plead with you this Sabbath morning, let no sin in our midst, let no sin retard our growth, keep and hinder and decapitate our growth towards our promised land. We're marching, we're marching to Zion. And I pray that no sin, not one leader, not one member should retard the growth of this camp going to heaven. And I need you to watch out for each other. God's command to Cain. Cain said, why are you asking for Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? The Bible doesn't say it, but I know God's response was yes. You are your brother's keeper. All of you are responsible for each other's spirituality. Hold each other up. Don't complain, don't make fun, don't mock, don't look down on any of us. 
Hold one another up in prayer. Hold them up. When you see your brother or sister going astray, go to them, lift them back up. Don't let them fall down. And when they fall, don't treat them like an outcast. Sit with them and tell them, I love you and I want you back in the family. We are a family, my friends. We are a family. Nobody is getting to heaven if they're getting there individually. You can forget about heaven. We are a family and we are to watch out for one another. Lift up one another in prayer and courage and uplift so that nobody is left out but all, all enter the promised land. Sin retards our growth to the promised land. Lastly, lastly, in the same verses, I need you to see a warning that was first given to us. If you sin, sin retards, sin keeps us from getting to heaven. Sin keeps Jesus from coming soon. And now, in the same verse, we want to see the love of God. Take a look at it. <clears throat> and Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. And the people journeyed not because, because, because sin had crept into them and sin retarded their growth. But the verse continues and says, And the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. My friends, if there is a sin you are cherishing today, if there is an evil habit that you are still keeping in your heart and it's keeping you away from God, it's not letting you love God enough, it's not allowing you to grow in a relationship with Him, to study His Word and to preach His Word and to take His Word out, then I need you to know that sin has to be cast out if you want to march on. But the Bible also tells me that when a sinner was thrown out, they could not journey, it retarded their growth. But I need you to see also God's love. God did not let them move till the sister was brought back in. My friends, they were not allowed to keep marching till the lost soul was brought back into the fold. The lost sheep that went out, God said, I know the 99 are safe, but I still want to go out for that one lost sheep and I will not let you move till the lost sheep is in again. You, I need you to understand if this morning you feel left out, if you feel you've lost your way, if you feel you've fallen and have thrown yourself asunder, God's promise is do not worry. Do not worry. I will bring you back into the camp. I will bring them back. I love you and I cannot lose you and I cannot let my people keep marching and keep someone outside we will not leave anyone behind leaders I need you to understand that there is a very sacred responsibility that rests upon each and every one of you every friend you've ever had every family member you have and exists they are your responsibility Go out with that concern and that care that God has to save the lost sheep and bring them into the fold. Forget about responsibilities and events and programs and, and accolades and certificates. Trash all of this. We have one purpose. One purpose to gather people in the camp in these last days. We will not allow sin. We will not allow sin to destroy anybody here and to hinder our growth to our promised land. Is that clear? All eyes are closed. All heads are bowed. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. I need you to talk to God and I need you to ask God, God, what kind of a leader am I? I saw three leaders today, God. I saw three leaders. I want you to help me identify which leader am I. Lord, am I a Miriam who is leading the errands astray? Who is setting a bad example for my friends and family, my teachers and my classmates? Oh Lord, Am I an Aaron who is being misled by someone's bad example? Because my eyes are to be on Jesus, not on some person. 
not on some pastor, not on some evangelist. My eyes have to be fixed on Jesus and Jesus alone because men can fail, but Jesus never fails. Yet someone else is asking God, have I taken my eyes off of you? Lord, you alone who, have the, who has the power to deliver me from sin, has the power to rescue me out of the struggle and the burden of sin. God, have I taken my eyes off of you? They call me a leader. Yes, it sounds good, but I know, I know how my soul is caving in on the inside. Father, have I gone astray? I need you to take a moment and reflect on that sin that is hindering you in your walk with God. I'll give you a moment. I'll give you a moment. Ponder on that which has retarded your growth to your promised land. Not going to spend too much time there. We're going to shift now. We're going to shift now. Next, if you want to be that disciple of God, if you want to be that leader that's ordained and baptized by the Holy Spirit, you are shouting out to God in your heart right now. And you're saying, God, I want this sin taken out. I want the sin outside the camp because I cannot go outside the camp. I will be here and nobody will shake me. I've decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back now. God, whatever that sin is, I plead and cry out to you. Take it and throw it out the door. I'll give you a moment right now. Whatever it is, whatever that leprosy is that is eating you away, I plead with you at this moment to come to the feet of Jesus and ask him, to throw it away. I want you to lift your hearts now. I want you to lift your hearts now and plead to God, God, I want to be a Moses. I want to be a Moses. So when people mock me, God, I will not speak against. I will go on my knees. When my ministry is troubled and challenged, God, I will not fight back. I will not give up, but I will go on my knees. God, I know you're watching. You've hope for me. You have power promised to me and I know you will give it to me. Help me not to be discouraged by what the devil throws my way. Help me to keep my eyes gazing, gazing, gazing upon the sacrifice of Jesus. I plead with you now to picture, picture your Jesus on the cross. And I pray that for the rest of your life, may you never, ever take your eyes off of Jesus. Tremble, live in trembling and fear. Move every day, understanding that it should be you and me on the cross, not Jesus. He did not sin. He did not sin. I plead then that each and every one here, may walk through the rest of this three-day journey, walk through the rest of the journey of life with your eyes fixed only on Jesus. I pray then as leaders, I pray then as leaders that you are resolving, you are resolving this very moment in your heart that God, I don't care about the position I will get in Amicus or in every, any, other, in any other organization. Lord, my highest position is that I will bring souls to the kingdom of God. Lord, I don't care about any other certificate or accolade or reward or money. What I'm looking forward to is winning one more soul and leading them to Jesus. And I know, Lord, 
that will not begin with me preaching great sermons and holding crusades. That will begin with me setting the right example. Make me then the leader you want me to be and help me to fix my eyes on the master leader, Jesus Christ. Leaders here then, your eyes are closed, your heads are bowed. If you want to be that leader for Jesus, if you want to cast sin out of the camp, if you take the responsibility for one another to lift each other up and bring more people into the kingdom of heaven, if you want to be that Moses and prepare people for the march to promised land that are waiting for Jesus to come and take us home, if you resolve to be that leader in the presence of God, you're standing to your feet then. If you're resolving to be that leader for God, you're standing on your feet at this moment. Only if, my friends, this, this is a serious event. This is, this is a serious event. This is a serious call. Nobody's taking this lightly. And I don't want you to stand if you're not impressed to stand. You're standing if you've resolved in your heart that you will throw this leprosy out. And you will allow none but God to be your focus. You will not allow anybody to mislead you and you have resolved that from this day on, Lord, I do not want to mislead anyone. If that is your prayer, only then are you standing. You're standing to be a resolved leader, a leader whose head is straight and his mind is focused on being the leader Christ wants you to be. The call has come to us. He wants us to be a peculiar people. Wants us to be a royal priesthood. Wants us to go out to the far ends of the earth. And he needs the Moseses of this day and age to stand up and give their lives to the Lord. Maybe there is a Miriam here. Maybe there is a Miriam who feels so lost and so away from the camp. But today you want your leprosy cleansed. Today you want your heart and your body cleansed and sanctified and you want to walk with God. You are standing to your feet. You want to be cleansed from the leprosy of sin. Then you are standing on your feet. You want to be emptied of self and pride and vanity and you want to be like Jesus for the rest of your life. You are standing to your feet. God's promise and his word of assurance to each of you is this promise in the Bible that if we confess and repent the Bible tells me my friends that he is faithful and just to forgive us he will not hold it back from you my friends I promise you and I guarantee you that I've come all this way not just to give you a false hope but the word assures us that each time we confess and repent he is faithful and just to forgive us not just only does he forgive us, but he cleanses us, the Bible says, of all unrighteousness so that we all can become like Jesus. I need you to hold your head high because God has called you and God has forgiven you. I need you to look up into the heavens and know that God is your eternal refuge and will keep you from falling away. I leave you with this hope. And I pray that if it is your desire to walk with God, to live for Jesus, to be the leader you have been called to be, then you will live, love, serve only God and not man. If this is your prayer, if this is your desire, let's all kneel together as we pray. Let's all kneel as we pray. Faithful Father, what a joy it is to know what a joy it is to know, O oh Father, that even when the leprosy has eaten us, your promise is that you will make us whole again. When we are eaten away by sin, your promise is, God, that you will heal us and bring us back to the position you want us to stand upon. I praise your name, Father. I praise your name, for you have gathered us together. You have spoken to us, O oh Lord. Your voice is heard, and I praise you. I praise you for it, for I know I am not worthy, not worthy to part my lips and even call upon your name. Glory be to you, O God. Glory be to you for what you have done. 
hearts stubborn as stone that you have melted, voices that you have lifted up in praise, commitments and decisions that you have sealed. O oh Lord, I cry out to you then, forgive us, cleanse us, and prepare us for our promised land. It is my prayer that Amicus and every association related to them may be an instrument of salvation for many in this dying city. I pray that you may take them far out, not just in this nation, but to the far ends of the earth to tell the world that Jesus is coming soon. And there is hope, there is victory. The Bible tells me there is no name under heaven where man shall be saved except for the name Christ Jesus. Help us then, O oh God, help us to stay steadfast on our march, to be moving with power and vigor and strength, to gather others in and prepare for Jesus is coming soon. We praise you, God, for speaking to us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for breaking us. And we praise you for assuring us that we shall be saved in Jesus. Praise, honor, glory, and adoration belongs only unto your name, O God. We pray this, thanking you and praising you for answering our prayers. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.